Good evening uh, and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us for uh, tonight's live Q&A with Wayne State University Law School titled Do's, Don'ts, and How To's Personal Statement Roundtable. Uh, my name is Justin Williams. I am the Associate Director of Admissions here at Wayne State University Law School. Uh, joined by my esteemed colleague, Jill Burnett Maurice, who's our graduate programs outreach speci specialist and a Wayne Law alum. Say hi to the crowd, Jill. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here to chat with you guys. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us, Jill. Uh, so we'll be pretty straightforward this evening. I've got a few slides I want to show you all sort of setting the table. Uh, in terms of what a personal statement is, the law school admissions process, how the personal statement uh, sort of sits neatly in that process. Uh, and then we'll save some time at the end to go through the questions that you all have submitted. And then also touch on any questions that come up as we go through our conversation. I'm fairly confident uh, that some of the questions that we've already received uh, will be answered just based on the content we have. Uh, but we've got some experts here in the house, so uh, anything that we can't, we don't answer through the presentation, uh, we will most certainly get to uh, in our Q&A portion. So uh, let's take a step back. Uh, I'm going to pull the, the view on this back uh, a little bit and give us a 50,000 foot overview of the law school admissions process, right? So uh, what are law schools looking for specifically? Uh, so typically when I have this conversation, uh, I try to frame it in these three really big questions uh, that I believe law schools are trying to answer. So uh, the first one is, can you do the work, right? What do you bring to the table academically? Uh, and how do we get to that? Uh, it starts with uh, assessing your academic ability and performance, utilizing those traditional factors. So uh, your performance on the law school admission test or the GRE, depending on the schools you choose, uh, your GPA, right? Or your performance in undergrad and what it means uh, so schools are looking at uh, the rigor of the institution you attended, uh, the rigor of the program, the kinds of courses you've taken, trends in performance, uh, those sorts of things to make, get a better understanding of what that GPA means. Uh, also, to a lesser extent, using letters of recommendation. And so the role that those can play uh, in making that assessment of academic ability and performance uh, is it provides an admissions committee and specifically one that uh, may have faculty on it uh, some insight into who you are in the classroom, right? So uh, it can be a preference for law school faculty to hear the opinion of somebody uh, in the professoriate uh, on who you are in the classroom, how you show up each day, what you contribute, and how you function in that space, uh, sort of as an affirmation of what we see uh, in terms of your grades. So uh, after we answer that question about whether or not you can uh, be successful in the academic environment we have at any individual law school. Uh, then we delve into uh, the second piece, which we'll talk about in terms of what do you bring to the table beyond those academic accomplishments? What's the value add uh, of admitting you to that law school uh, community and then also to the law school, to the, uh, to the profession at large, right? And so we're looking for personality, accomplishments, character, and then fit. Uh, and the pieces that play a central role uh, in making that assessment are your personal statement, which we'll talk about uh, at some length this evening, uh, your resume, which I know some of you do have questions about, uh, your letters of recommendation to a lesser extent. So if you've got some professional references or uh, those, pers those professors uh, can give us some insight into who you are as a person and what value you may add to the classroom, that can be influential there. Uh, and then any sorts of addenda that you submit with your application. Uh, and typically what happens is that people will submit an addendum when there's a thing about their application uh, that may cause a question mark. So uh, if your undergraduate grades aren't reflective of your uh, academic ability for whatever reason, students may submit a addenda to explain that. Or if you, you're not a historically great test taker, but you typically outpace that uh, in the classroom, uh, students will submit an addendum to explain that. If you answer in the affirmative to uh, a law school's character and fitness questions in their application materials, uh, you are required to submit an addendum uh, with some sort of explanation of what happened, right, and what the outcome was or where things stand. So uh, those are some of the sorts of addenda that you can submit to an application that can be used to answer that second question. 
Uh, and then there's a third really big question that you necessarily uh, don't get a vote in. And that's how you compare to the rest of the applic applicant pool. So it's you versus everybody, right? So what are the institution's enrollment goals? What do they want the nature and character of their class to be uh, in the cycle that you apply? Uh, and how do you fit into that tapestry that they're trying to weave? Uh, and then also, uh, how do you compare to the rest of the applicant pool, right? So how does your profile stack up uh, with the rest of the law, the, uh, law school hopefuls that are applying to that institution? Uh, how does that fit into the you know, sort of the bigger picture about what the pool looks like, even locally, regionally, nationally as well? So uh, those are the sorts of things that law schools generally are looking for. Now, there may be some other law schools out there that are using a different sort of rubric, right? Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, I think most law schools that you would be trying to apply to will be using a criteria similar to this to make those decisions. So uh, when we talk about the personality, accomplishments, character, and fit piece, that big second piece, uh, I want to take a second to dive a little deeper onto those pieces because I think that's the spirit of today's session. Uh, so we'll talk about the personal statement in a big, broad sense. So uh, typically the writing for a personal statement is going to be formal, and it's also going to be in a narrative voice. I know one of the questions that was submitted before we started today was about whether or not uh, it's important to use a narrative voice or to sort of be explanatory, right? And I think the expectation generally is that it is going to be that first person narrative uh, where you're telling your story, right? You're providing uh, the law school admissions teams uh, an opportunity to get to know you in a way that they could not know you uh, without having that personal statement. It's your opportunity to tell your story almost like an interview, right? So uh, if you approach it that way, I think you'll uh, find yourself satisfied with your outcomes and the content you produce. Uh, typically, I think the length, at least for us, uh, is two pages. I think most students can hit the nail on the head in that space. Uh, but I want to encourage you all to be very thoughtful about the length. Uh, some schools will accept much longer personal statements. I've got colleagues in the profession uh, who will accept up to five pages, right? It just depends on what the law school's intent is and how they may use uh, that particular document, right? Uh, so just be thoughtful about that and to check with the institutions you're applying to uh, when you're putting together that personal statement to make sure that the length that you uh, have given yourself for the personal statement fits into what their expectations are. Uh, in terms of content, uh, I get a lot of content-based questions. Jill, I know you do too. Uh, and I typically tell people you can talk about almost anything you want to talk about, right? So long as it ends sort of in a positive note. Uh, I'm probably going to age myself here, uh, but the last thing you want an admissions committee to be asking after reading your personal statement is where's the beef, right? Where's the punchline? Where's the hook? Uh, so if something challenging has happened to you in your life uh, and you want to use the personal statement as an opportunity to talk about that part of your story, I think the end or at some point in there, you have to help us understand OK, well, what happened to you because of that? Right. Who did you become? How has that informed your law school choice? Right. How has that informed your desire to go to law school? Like, what does this have to do with the goal that you've uh, set for yourself, which is to be admitted to a law school? Right. So if you can make that connection in a positive way, I think the world is your oyster. Right. In terms of the things that you can uh, you can talk about. Uh, there are some students who choose to write about the things that make them unique and diverse. Uh, in your personal statements. Uh, there are also some institutions that will accept a separate diversity statement, right? So I think if you're thinking about or considering writing about your diversity as a thing that you want the law school to know in that personal statement, ask if they accept a separate diversity statement so that you aren't you doing the same thing twice, right? You aren't retelling the same story. Uh, so be thoughtful about that piece as well. Uh, and the last uh, bullet point I have here, but I think one of the most important uh, is the writing ability piece. Uh, this is a piece of professional writing. Uh, law school faculty that sit on admissions committees and even admissions committee members, right, are using the document to assess your ability to write clearly, concisely and effectively. Right. Uh, so I think that you have to be thoughtful about that. I encourage anybody that's doing a personal statement to write it more than once. And what that means is draft it. Uh, and then revise your draft, and then revise your draft some more. 
Uh, if you're still in undergrad or, or in graduate school or still uh, connected to your undergraduate institution, uh, I would encourage you to think about submitting your uh, drafted personal statement to your writing center. Uh, provide them an opportunity uh, to take a look at the document that you submitted uh, to check it for grammar, punctuation, spelling errors, right? That low hanging fruit uh, that can add an extra layer of polish to your personal statement. Uh, the next piece is resume, right? Uh, the resume for most places is just gonna be a chronological ordering of the things you've done uh, while you were in college and post-graduation. I think it should include information about your education, uh, your work history, any volunteer or leadership experience. Uh, for those of you who are seasoned professionals, uh, I think you should think about how much information you have to share and then what are the things that are the highlights, right? Uh, and then this is another thing where you may want to talk to the institutions uh, that you're applying to to make sure that the resume that you're submitting sort of aligns with their expectations. Uh, so for us as an institution, you know, I think that we're confident that we can find out what we need to find out about most people's professional history in about two pages. Uh, if you are a recent graduate or somebody who hasn't had uh, a lot of work history or leadership or volunteer work, I think one page is probably good enough, right? So uh, you want to think about uh, making sure that the resume that you submit aligns with the expectations of the institutions to which you apply. Uh, letters of recommendation, we've talked about this too, uh, already, and I want to make sure that we get into this a little bit more. Uh, so I think the kinds of letters that you should think about submitting will depend on the kind of applicant you are, right? So if you're someone who's coming directly from undergraduate to the law school process, I think it's you're best suited if you submit letters uh, from professors or other uh, others who can comment on your intellectual abilities and academic performance. Uh, the preference would probably be for professors. I know some of you may be at institutions where you work with TAs a little bit more or uh, graduate uh, uh, sort of students who are doing that teaching. If you can find professors, right, that will be helpful. If it's a graduate, uh, a grad student who's taught you multiple times, I think that can be helpful as well. Uh, for those of you who are a little further away, right, so you've got a handful of years or more of professional experience, uh, I think you should worry less about trying to find a professor or faculty member uh, and worry more about finding somebody who's who knows you and who wants to vouch for your law school candidacy, right? And really the umbrella here is what you want are letters of recommendation for people who are willing to uh, make a strong case for your fitness for legal education and potentially the practice of law. Uh, so that's sort of the big umbrella that covers this topic. And then underneath it, it's about who you are as an applicant. So if you're a recent grad, uh, you wanted to come from professors or others who've taught you. Uh, if you're not as recent a grad, uh, I think employers or other professional relationships or connections uh, from people who want to vouch for your candidacy are a great fit. Uh, we talked about addenda, but of course, if there are character and fitness concerns, you have to submit them. Uh, and the way that they're used typically in the process uh, is to provide context, right, about potential red flags in your application or question marks in the process. <clears throat> All right, so what is a personal statement? I think we've talked some of the biographical sort of information about it and uh, some of how it's used, but what is an actual personal statement? Uh, so again, it's a professional writing piece, right? I can't say enough about that. I want to make sure that you all walk away from this conversation uh, with that as a clear understanding. Uh, if you've never written a professional writing piece, this is your first crack at that apple. So please make it uh, as professional as humanly possible. So that means it should be free from error, uh, properly uh, sort of formatted, right? So make sure that you ask a law school about what their formatting expectations are. You see I've seen some weird fonts, right? Some weird use of margins. Uh, and you wanna make sure that your uh, the personal statement you submit aligns with the schools that you're uh, applying to their expectations. And it's also a supporting document uh, in the application process. Uh, frequently I've uh, received the question from students, can a strong personal statement sort of offset uh, a weak academic profile, right? And I think the answer to that in most cases is probably no, right? We want to have confidence 
uh, as law school admissions professionals that we're admitting somebody who demonstrates the aptitude to be successful uh, and compete with the kinds of students we admit, uh, understanding the rigor of our education and uh, what we expect of our students. You know, so it's a supporting piece, right? It helps paint this bigger picture of who you are uh, that will help us make that informed choice about your fitness for our program and for the practice. Uh, it's also that opportunity, right, to introduce the admissions committee to aspects of who you are as an applicant that they may not find elsewhere. Uh, so if you're thinking about your personal statement and what you're doing is taking what's in your resume and porting it over uh, to the personal statement, I think that's probably not a great use of that space, right? It's valuable real estate of which you do not have an unlimited amount. Uh, and what you want to do is say, OK, well, let's take a step back, look at my entire application and figure out, well, what are the things that an admissions committee needs to know about me to really make an informed choice about my fitness uh, for that institution that they can't get from the other parts of this application? So how do I tell them something new and different about me that I believe is important uh, for them to utilize in their decision making process, considering the kind of decision that they're about to make about me. Uh, and so those are, I think, three big pieces to keep in mind when you're thinking about what a personal statement is. Now, so what do I write about? Uh, and I, this is another one of those questions that we get very frequently. And I think I've touched on this a little bit, but uh, we can take another step here, maybe walk a little further along this journey, uh, because I think students very often want to know well, what's off limits, right? What are the kinds of things that I should not talk about? What should not touch? What's uh, the, the universe of things that law schools will automatically look at and sort of discount me for? Uh, and I think it's less about what you say and more about how you say it, right? Uh, if you end it on that positive note, if you help the law school understand how whatever this thing is, right, is informing your choice to apply to law school and uh, gives the, the committee enough information about you to make that informed choice about your fitness for them as an institution, I think you've done the right thing. Uh, there isn't a necessarily a magic personal statement that will get you into everywhere you want to go. Um, you know, I think you have to be first honest in the process about who you are, right? Authenticity matters. Uh, I think that that part about it being a professional piece of writing is also hugely important. And I think if you can walk away from your personal statement saying, hey, here are two or three things about me that you absolutely need to know to be able to make that informed choice about me as an applicant, I think you've done a very good job, right, of using the personal statement to make your case. So you have to ask yourself, well, what does my application not say that I believe should be said about me? And how do I convey that effectively and coherently in a professional way in this application? So I think the universe of topics that you can touch on uh, is pretty broad and pretty deep. Um, sometimes students ask, OK, well, what about you know religion or cultural or social issues? Can I write about those things? I think the answer is maybe if you can make a compelling case that that's connected to you specifically, it's driving your decision to want to do this and it's helping inform the choice and your positions on these things are something that a committee would have to know right before they make that decision on you as an applicant. So uh, also consider the schools that you're applying to. Right. I mean, you know, schools have personalities, have character, sort of have thinking thought processes. Right. Uh, and then maybe a diverse set of eyes that are looking at your application. So uh, just be thoughtful about how those opinions on some of these issues may come across and how a school may read those, uh, not because a school would treat you differently in the process, right? But I think that you have to be thoughtful about that uh, in terms of what you, what you talk about and how you talk about it. All right, so additional stuff. Again, the addendum piece, uh, LSAT, GPA, and then character and fitness are really the circumstances when most people would use an addendum. Uh, I think you can get an addendum done in a half a page or a page. Uh, if that's something that you feel like you need to submit related to those things, it doesn't necessarily need to be more than that, unless there's like a really long story, right? And even if it is a long story, you can, I, I would encourage people to make a long story short, right? Because you don't want that to become sort of the central piece of your application. All right, so we're going to move into some of the questions that we have here. Uh, and I've got uh, some of my backstage help. I want to give a quick shout out to our communications team, Kaylee Place, who's doing the uh, the work of communicating to us the questions that you have. 
Uh, I'm so excited to welcome my colleague Jill into the conversation to help us get these questions answered. Uh, so Jill, really quickly, just tell them a little bit about yourself, who you are, your story. Yeah, absolutely. So like Justin said before, I am the graduate programs outreach specialist in the office. So really, I'm just one of the additional admissions advisors that works on our team. I am a Wayne Law alum. I graduated a couple years ago in 2017. And while I was here in the law school, I was really, really involved both with the staff and faculty um, and also the students as part of the student government. I actually worked in this office as a student for a semester as a student ambassador. And so when I saw the opportunity to kind of join, rejoin the Wayne Law community in a professional setting, I kind of jumped and I leapt for it. Absolutely. All right. Well, well, thank you for that brief introduction, Jill. We'll get right into these questions. Uh, I'm going to toss the first one to you. I know you've been in uh, plenty of admissions committee meetings and heard <laughs> very clearly from them the kinds of things that they value and what they see as important. So uh, one of our first questions here uh, is asking if the committee has anything specifically in personal statements they like to see from applicants who are non-traditional, right? So they've been out in the workforce done some things and are considering law school as either like a mid-career or late career change. Yeah, so what I think is a really great opportunity for students who, what we call non-traditional, have had some other life experiences beyond undergrad is to use your personal statement to talk about those additional experiences because that's something that makes you unique. Um, we always get second career students that come into our office um, wanting to go to law school, but we don't always have a lot of students either that have all of these additional life experiences um, that they've gotten either through working or just kind of going through the process. So I think that using the personal statement as an opportunity to really talk about the things that you've experienced beyond undergrad is a really great route that you can take. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's right. I mean, the, you know, if you've got a unique set of experiences that are informing your choice, right, and you, you feel like you're bringing a perspective to the table that's different, I think a personal statement is a good place to touch on that. Uh, so a question from Skylar about GPA. Uh, if your GPA isn't super high, but have taken some higher level courses and done well, does that help? Uh, I think the answer to that is maybe, right? I mean, I think the number matters, right? So the final number where you land uh, is an important part of the law school application consideration process. Uh, but I think we do take a look at the courses that you've taken, the challenge of those courses, the rigor of those courses to really determine, okay, well, what does this GPA say about your readiness to move into law school studies, right? I think that's sort of where it all lands. Um, but Jill, I don't know, what do you think? Is that yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I definitely have seen from our committee meetings where our committee members take a look at the transcripts and maybe students started out doing a little less great in the beginning, but then have an upward trend and do so much better. And I think that is something that they do take into consideration and it can have a significant impact sometimes depending on what classes you took and what the changes look like. Absolutely. Uh, so, follow a sort of a secondary question. Is there anything admissions does not want to see? Uh, so I'm, this is asking, I think, is there, you know, there, is there any forbidden fruit, right, in the law school admissions process? So, Joe, from your perspective, is there anything you think an, uh, an admissions committee would not want to see? Um, well, I think at least for the personal statement, um, nothing makes me cringe more than when students just re-explain their resume. Um, like Justin mentioned before, this is your opportunity to really sell yourself to us and tell us things that we're not going to be able to learn about you anywhere else in your application. So for me personally, I would not recommend rewriting your resume. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, as you know, specifically talking about the personal statement, I mean, that's, uh, again, an opportunity for you to tell a story about you that we can't get anywhere else. Right. And if all you do is reiterate your academic accomplishments or uh, what you've done outside the classroom and those are things that we can get from the rest of the application, it may feel like a missed opportunity. Right. So, yeah, I think that's that that is absolutely right. Uh, the next question is a little bit more of a personal question about retaking the LSAT. Uh, and, you know, I won't get into the numbers that this person shared, but I think the question you have to ask yourself when you're thinking about your academic profile, specifically your GPA and then your LSAT, is how does that fit right into a law school's sort of typical it admit admit pool, not just their applicant pool, but like the people that they admit. Uh, LSAC has some good tools 
uh, for you to use. So uh, there's a resource that they have that will uh, sort of give you a broad idea of what your chances are, what the best schools are for you uh, based on your LSAT and your GPA. Uh, if you use that tool and you aren't satisfied with what those options might look like for you, then I think you should consider retaking the LSAT, right? Uh, so there's sort of a rule of thumb, right, that at a certain point there's diminishing returns on the number of times that you take the LSAT and what your progress can be, right? Uh, most people vacillate, you know, over the course of a few points in either direction. So they'll go up a handful of points. Sometimes they go down a handful of points, right? It's just, you know, it's it's a rare case when somebody makes a significant jump in performance. And that's typically because the first time they took it, either they hadn't prepared, right? Like they were using the first time they took it as like a diagnostic, right? Um, you know, or something catastrophic happened on exam day and they just weren't at their best. So I think if maybe either of those scenarios applies to you, then maybe retake. But the first thing you should do is see what your options are based on your profile. And if you don't like your <coughs> options, then maybe it presents an opportunity for you to think about retaking. All right, Jill, what do you think? I think that is exactly right. Um, in addition to looking at LSAC, I would say go on the different schools that you're considering's yep. website and take a look at what their numbers for their incoming class for the last year was and things like that and kind of see where you fall into those numbers. Obviously, depending on the school, numbers might not be everything, but I do think that taking a look at what their recent class looked like could kind of help you figure out whether you might want to retake it or not. Absolutely. Uh, so the next question, do you write one personal statement or multiple personal statements to tailor to the different schools you apply to? Uh, Jill, I'm going to give you first crack at that one. What do you think? So I think that it depends. Um, mm -hmm. I think in general, the whole point of your personal statement is to sell yourself mm -hmm. to the school. Mm -hmm. um, so realistically, if you think that your one personal statement is really reflective of who you are, then I don't necessarily think it's super important to make sure that you tailor to each individual school. Mm -hmm. However, if there is something about one particular school that's really selling you on that school or one particular thing that you know about that school and there's one characteristic about you that th you think would make you a perfect fit based upon what you know about that school, then sure, go ahead and edit and tailor a little bit to it. But overall, I think that the main thing you're trying to sell is yourself. And so if you can do one solid personal statement that's really showing who you are as an applicant, I think it's probably okay to stick with one core set of details um, to submit to multiple schools. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, if, you know, I think the other piece that I would say is uh, check and see what a law school wants you to write about, right? I mean, if a law school has a very specific prompt that they want you to respond to, then that may require you to write more than one personal statement. So uh, it is a sales job first, right? You're trying to pitch yourself to a law school. And if you can do that with one personal statement, I say go forth courageously, right? Uh, but if a law school has a prompt and your the personal statement you've written doesn't respond to that, then you may need to think about uh, writing one that is very specifically uh, tailored to that institution. All right. So uh, do law schools prefer older candidates? Uh, that's a I don't think law schools prefer older candidates. I think law schools prefer prepared candidates. Right. And that comes in uh, many different shapes, sizes and forms. Uh, you can come directly from undergrad and be prepared and ready, right? You can be somebody who was out on the market and did a job and sort of walk into law school and be prepared as well. So uh, it really is about answering those questions, right? Do we have confidence you can do the work? What's the value add? And then sort of how do you fit into this bigger picture that we're trying to paint in any particular academic year? So Jill, what are your thoughts? I think I agree with everything that you just said. All right, fantastic. So uh, the next question here, I received advice that a personal statement should focus on an event in your life where you did something instead of stating what you have learned or hope to do. I also received to not explicitly describe myself with adjectives, but leave that to the reader to assume from my actions accomplishments. Do you recommend this as well? OK, so that's a that's sort of a thorny question that really asks, you know, what do you write about? Right. I mean, and I think if you ask 20 different people what they think you should do on your personal statement, 
you'll probably get 20 different responses, right? It's just that kind of sort of thing. And the personal statements that have stuck out to me in the process have all stuck out to me for different reasons, right? I think it's really about what's your story and how do you want it to be told, right? What's the things about you? What are the things about you that a law school has to know to make that informed choice about whether or not you're a good fit for them? Maybe it is about a life event, right? Or maybe, or maybe it's about, you know, talking about something that you learned in your life or you hope to do in the future. That can also be really compelling. I think it's really just about how you want your story to be told and what you want to gain from the process. But Jill, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think. Yeah, I think I completely agree with that. I think what you need to focus on is take a moment to really reflect on yourself and say, what has been most significant in my life? What is something that has been so impactful in my life that has shaped me into the person that I am that I need to share this piece of information with the committee? And like Justin said, that could be an an event that occurred. Um, it could be a particular class where you learned something that really left a lasting impact on you, or it could be um, what you ultimately want to do as an attorney or with a law degree, or it could be a combination of both. I've seen excellent personal statements that start off talking about a life event, what they learned from that, and how it's inspired them to go to law school. So like Justin said, I don't think there is one good way to write a personal statement. It really comes back to what are the main things you want everyone to know about you. Absolutely. All right. So this is a letter of recommendation question uh, for someone who's a recent graduate, um, like December last year. Uh, how important from your perspective, Jill, is it for them to get a letter of recommendation from a professor? So I can at least say for our law school, it is a required component and that the faculty that sit on our committee look very, very heavily mm -hmm. um, to those letters of recommendation. And I think that because you are such a recent graduate, it is probably going to be really important for us to help determine that one portion of the admissions process of what kind of student are you going to be? Because the people who just recently taught you are going to have hopefully have a good insight that they can kind of help us fill in the pieces of that. And that's what you're going to get through um, an academic letter of recommendation. Absolutely. Uh, so there's a question about whether or not there's a place to find great personal statement examples. Uh, Jill, have you seen anywhere specifically where you find great personal statement examples? Not any particular website that I can recommend, but I think doing a good old fashioned Google search um, might be a good place to start. I agree with that 100%. I mean, and then I think what you'll find is it great is subjective, right? Uh, I've read some that people have been like, oh, this was such a compelling personal statement. And I've been like, eh, okay, you know, sure, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's more art than science. And I think that's the, I guess, maybe the, the major takeaway I want everybody to have is that this is inexact, right? I mean, what's compelling to one person on an admissions committee may not ring a bell for somebody else. It's just all you can really do is make the best case for yourself that you can uh, and leave it up to the to, to the fates. And may the odds be ever in your favor, right, that you're uh, chosen for the institutions that you uh, see the value in. All right. So uh, addenda, uh, how should they be formatted and do we have any examples? Uh, so we don't have any examples offhand, right? Uh, but Jill, any thoughts about the formatting and how that might look? I think for me, I would pay attention to the way that the school wants the personal statement formatted when it comes to double space, normal font, 12 point font, things like that. But specifically when you're writing it, I would recommend making it as short and concise as possible without leaving out any important details. So you don't need to have all the nitty gritty details, but you don't want to leave any gaps um, for the admissions committee to kind of have to fill in on their own. So tell us exactly what happened, why it happened, things like that, if applicable, what you learned from it and kind of, I would recommend leaving it at that. Absolutely. I think that is 100% correct. All right. So uh, we've got another question about GPA. Uh, so somebody who's got stronger grades in major than they do overall in terms of their GPA. Uh, and then how the committee would weigh grades for certain classes higher than others, right? So how they might see that weight. Uh, and then is it just the GPA as a whole that's considered? Uh, so I guess I'll go with the last part of that question first. 
I mean, the GPA is a number you can't get away from, right? Law schools are going to continue to consider that so long as we have to report it, right? I mean, it's just the nature of how law school admissions works at this particular point in time, that law schools broadly consider that GPA as that exact number. Uh, but it is about sort of peeling that back, right? Peeling that onion and seeing what else exists in that number, right? So if we're, you know, looking at somebody who's got a 3.2 overall GPA, but you know, they did put significantly better in, you know, these chemistry, math courses, engineering courses, right? Courses that we know may, you know, present a little bit more rigor than say like basket weaving, right? Uh, you know, I think that can uh, sort of lead a committee to believe that you are prepared academically to step into the law school space and be successful. So uh, Jill, any thoughts on that? Nope, I think you did. You kind of hit the nail right on the head with that one. All right, good deal. Uh, so we're going to go back to the explaining your resume piece. So uh, questions here. How do you talk about your experiences without explaining your resume? This, this person's having a challenge uh, doing that. So any advice? So I think I would recommend talking about things that are probably a little bit just beyond the skills or the normal bullet points that you're going to fill in on the resume. Um, if you're going to focus uh, on that in your personal statement, talk about specific experiences and broader picture things that you learned and um, how it's maybe shaped the way that you think or um, has had an impact on why you want to go to law school. Other things that are just beyond the tasks that you accomplished and learned um, while performing whatever job or being part of whatever organization. All right. So let's see here. So the next piece, uh, somebody's planning on retaking the LSAT in January. Uh, and then should they wait until they receive their score bef before sending in application materials or is that too late? Uh, and this is somebody who wants to start fall 2020. Uh, I think if you, for us, uh, we won't review the application in its entirety until we have an LSAT score. Uh, but if you've got the other pieces prepared and ready, I think you should send it in, right? There's no, unless you, you know, are sort of still working through your personal statement or something like that. If you've got the materials ready, uh, there's no barrier to you sending that stuff in now. And then when your LSAT score shows up, it just moves right into the pile for review. I tell people there's less stress on you, right? Once you've got those pieces in, then all you have to worry about or think about is preparing for the LSAT. So that's my two cents on that. Any Anything from you? Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, and specifically for this applicant, because I think that they said they're going to retake it. If you're looking at our school specifically, we will explain in the first letters that you'll receive from us once we get your application, if you decide to submit it beforehand, that we're gonna actually hold your application if we see you're registered for a future LSAT and we won't yeah. review it in its entirety until we receive that updated score. So going back to what Justin said, if you wanna submit it now and you're already registered for that future LSAT, our policy is gonna be to wait until we get that additional LSAT. But if you're looking at other schools, that might not be their policy. So give their admissions office a call and see what they would prefer um, and what their suggestions are. Absolutely. Uh, so next question, do we recommend submitting an addendum for a poor LSAT score, even if you've replaced it with a better one? So you scored better on a subsequent LSAT. Does it, is it necessary to submit uh, an addendum at that point? Um, I think that if there was some significant reason why your LSAT score wasn't as great the first time around, um, testing conditions, maybe something happened, you had a personal issue come up right before the exam, some significant reason that you really think impacted that score, then absolutely. Um, you basically want to fill in the gaps. You kind of want to tell the admissions committee why there might be this drastic change um, and just kind of explain that. Absolutely. I think that's right. All right. So uh, when should I take the LSAT if I want to start law school in fall 2021? Uh, so that is a, a great question. We do get uh, plenty of questions about LSAT timing, right? When's the appropriate time to take the LSAT? Uh, and the general rule of thumb is uh, you take the LSAT the summer before you plan to apply, right? So if you are considering starting law school in fall 2021, uh, there's a really good chance you'll start submitting your applications in fall 2020. So you'll want to uh, be prepared for and sit for uh, an LSAT likely that summer, right? So the summer of 2020 
would probably be the sweet spot for you in terms of when you want to sit for the LSAT uh, so that you'll have your score in time to be able to submit applications uh, as soon as the applications open, which for most schools is in early fall. That sound right, Jill? Yep, sounds right to me. That also gives you a little bit of time if you get that score back and it's not the score that you were hoping for and not a score that you're in love with. It'll give you a little bit of leeway to be able to take an LSAT and still get your application in within a reason time, reasonable time. Absolutely. All right. So uh, what are some examples of personal statements that stuck out to us both? Also, is a purpose statement different? Uh, Jill, I'll give you first bite at that apple. Any personal statements that sort of stick out to you in your mind? So I don't have any specific examples that I can talk about, but I can tell you that I generally enjoy reading about different experiences or events that the applicant wants to share with us that really shape them into who they are. Um, and that's kind of broad because there can be so many different experiences that people have that are important to them that have really helped them develop into the person that they are. But I really like reading those types of personal statements specifically. Absolutely. I think that's probably right for me too. I mean, I, I, I'm more compelled by your story, right? I mean, I think who you are, what, what shaped you, uh, what's driving you towards this choice has always been compelling to me. Um, but we're not the only people who make the decisions, right? I mean, there's, you know, multiple sets of eyes that see uh, personal statements. So I don't know if our, you know, our preferences ring true for everybody. Um, you know, but I think a well-written personal statement can't be beat, right? I mean, even if it's pretty straightforward, here are the reasons I want to go to law school and it's well-written, professional, polished, I think that, you know, that will uh, carry the day for you, right? So uh, be thoughtful about that. In terms of a purpose statement, uh, we don't accept a purpose statement. I think if a law school accepts one and you have questions about what it is, uh, it probably makes sense to reach out to them. Um, I don't even know of any schools offhand that sort of do that accept that, right? Or even ask for one of those. Uh, but if they do, there's probably some set of factors that they want you to touch on or address in that uh, statement. And it's probably a little bit different uh, than, a, than a, a personal statement is as well. So if you are seeing that, I'd encourage you to reach out to the institutions that are asking for it uh, to get some clarity from them about what their expectations are around it and how you might think about formatting or putting it together. Uh, so uh, when should we pay for LSAC and start filling in our resume? Uh, you want to start school in fall 2021. Uh, Jill, any immediate thoughts about when they should do those things? Um, I don't know if I necessarily think there's a particular timeline. Um, I think that uh, probably a good time to start filling out your LSAC account and probably making the payment is around the time that you sign up for the LSAT because you're going to yeah. have to do it through that website anyway. Absolutely. Um, same with filling in your resume. I don't think it hurts to start now, but if you don't have any other purpose um, other than you're creating one to apply to law school and then waiting a little longer two is going to be fine. Um, if you start now, you can kind of start thinking back and make sure that you capture all of the relevant experiences and organizations and things like that. And you don't miss anything. Um, whereas if you wait a year, you might forget something. Yep. But other than that, I don't think there's a hard timeline. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, all right. So can you offset a lower GPA with a higher LSAT, right? So and, and vice versa, really, can a higher GPA uh, sort of offset a lower LSAT? Uh, I think the answer is it depends, right? I mean, I think if you've got a strong, uh, these, what we call those in common sort of law school parlance is, is you know, somebody with mixed indicators or splitters as uh, mm -hmm. you may see on Reddit, because I know some of you are on Reddit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, but really, I mean, I think what a law school is trying to understand is who you are as a student, right? What do you, what's your academic ability? Uh, and if you've got one number that's significantly more, uh, you know, more competitive than the other, you know, I think an addendum that helps us understand why there is that difference between the two numbers uh, in either direction, right, I think is going to be important. So if you've got a, uh, an LSAT score that's a 173, I mean, the presumption is that you're somebody who probably should have done, you know, really well academically. And if that's not the case, I think a committee may be wondering, okay, well, what's happening here? Why? are those numbers, why do those numbers not match in the way that we would expect them to? So I think uh, they don't necessarily offset, right? So it's not like we'll say, oh, well, we're not worried about the uh, the LSAT score because the GPA is so high. 
I think what we're saying is we've got a number here that tells us somebody can do this, but we have some questions about why this other number doesn't match that, right? So helping us understand what the difference is between those things and why that difference exists can be helpful. But Jill, I'll kick it to you to see if you've got uh, any other feedback or a different take. Uh, nope, I think the whole it depends really, I think it is really a case by case um, scenario to where there's not one answer that's gonna fit all different uh, criteria for the applicant. Agreed, agreed. So uh, is it advantageous to apply earlier to Wayne State and then what is considered early? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes, right? I mean, it's it's a rolling admissions process. So, you know, as we're receiving applications, we're reviewing them and making decisions and we've got more room in the process earlier than we do later. Uh, for us, our priority scholarship deadline is March 15th. So, you know, we encourage people to submit their application materials uh, before that date so that they can receive full consideration uh, for scholarship dollars. Uh, after that, you will still receive consideration. It's just a question of how much money we have left at that point. And sometimes it's money, right? Sometimes we got plenty, sometimes we don't have much at all. Uh, you know, so I think I encourage people to apply early to give themselves the best opportunity uh, to be considered, especially if you have academic indicators that are maybe different than what the school's medians might be, because there's a little bit more room for us to make uh, broader decisions about people and we've got more room in the class to uh, to make those choices. So, but I don't know, Jill, what do you think? Nope, I think that's exactly right. Um, earlier is always better because we have more availability and more spots in the beginning of the year rather than if you wait till the end of the year. Um, May, March 15th for the priority scholarship deadline, but I realistically think sometime in like the January, early February is a really good timeline. That way you're not waiting till the last minute, pushing kind of that timeline. Absolutely. All right. So transcript question. Uh, so do you send a single transcript to LSAC or a transcript to every school to which you apply? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you send your application to LSAC. Uh, and then you work with LSAC to have that transcript sent to all of the institutions to which you apply. So there is something called a credential assembly service, which is what you will pay for as a part of your, uh, your law school application process. And then you send all, you have all of your transcripts sent to LSAC, and then you work with them to have that transcript sent in a credential assembly service report to all of the institutions to which you apply. So that's typically how that process works. You don't have to send us your transcript personally at that stage of the process. For every school in the country, I believe, you'll have to send them your final transcript, You know, your degree granting transcript uh, when it's all said and done. But in the application process, uh, LSAC sort of serves as the clearinghouse uh, and conduit for uh, the submission of those transcripts to the institutions you wanna apply to. All right, so uh, addendum question. Uh, should you write an addendum if you were on academic probation as a freshman, but your grades increased significantly after? Uh, Jill, I'm going to kick this one to you first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for us, the answer is yes. That's actually going to be one of the required character and fitness um, disclosures that you're going to have to make. I'm going to guess that probably every other law school that you are you might be applying to is also going to require that. And the way that I'd recommend approaching it is similar to what I discussed before. Um, keep it short and concise and give us all the necessary details without going too much into the nitty gritty. Say, this is what happened this semester. This is why it happened. Um, this is what I learned from it. And as you can see, I have made changes and I have now improved my grades and from there on out. Absolutely. So uh, we've got a question that was submitted beforehand about uh, creative license, right? So how much creative license do uh, you allow students in forming a unique personal statement? Uh, we don't grant the creative license, right? I mean, I think you have to decide how creative you want to be, uh, just bearing in mind that this isn't necessarily a creative writing exercise, right? So we aren't expecting you to be Walt Whitman or Robert Frost or J.K. Rowling or any of the you know, sort of the great weavers of words, uh, you know, but the expectation is that one, it'll be a, pro a solid professional piece of writing that will provide uh, a law school admissions committee with information about you that will be 
important in making the law school decision, right? So you can be as creative as you want to in that space, but it's not an obligation. It's not a commitment. Jill, what, what about you? What do you think? Yep, I completely agree with that. Um, you are given some freedom with the personal statement. Really, like we've said a bunch of times, it's your opportunity to show us who you are. So go ahead and be as creative as you want. But at the same time, make sure you're keeping in mind that this is a professional piece of writing as well. Absolutely. All right. So uh, the next one is another sort of topical question that uh, Jill, I know you were interested in trying to get answered. So uh, the, should you avoid taking a strong position on controversial cultural issues in your essay? Um, so I think going back to something that you said earlier is you need to focus more on how you might say those things and also the audience that you might be writing to. Um, take a look at the different communities and the values of the school that you're applying to. and Keep in mind that every not everyone that is going to be reading your application might feel the same exact way. So you don't want to be off-putting to someone either. So I think if you can say it in a way that is not going to come off too harsh or too strong to someone, um, and you can kind of walk that fine line, then okay. Um, but I would be very cautious just because, like I said, you are not entirely sure who is going to be reading it and what their values and beliefs are. Absolutely. I think that's right. I mean, you have to, you know, I, I encourage people to be thoughtful about what they share without feeling like they have to censor themselves. Right. You know, so this isn't saying that you can't write about something that may be uh, like an edgy or controversial subject. But I think you should be thoughtful about how you tell that story, what that may communicate to an admissions committee and whether or not that's what you want them to know. Right. I mean, this is precious real estate, right? So you have to think about the decision that they're trying to make and how this thing fits into uh, informing them in that decision-making process, right? If it's not central or important, I would say you need to think about whether or not you have to share it in that context, or if that's something you can just talk to people about once you're admitted, right? I mean, that's really, you know, sort of my thinking on it, right? But if it's something that sits deeply in your heart and you believe that a committee cannot make a decision about you without hearing your perspective or how, you know, this particular subject has informed your choice to go to law school, I say write about it, right? Write about what you want to. It's your personal statement, right? It's not a us statement, it's a you statement. So, uh, you know, just be thoughtful about the, the way in which you present it. Uh, and, you know, I think everything's on the table uh, until it isn't, right? So uh, that's my advice on the subject. Uh, so what's a characteristic that separates good from great in personal statements, right? It separates a good personal statement from one that is very impactful. Uh, this is gonna seem like uh, sort of a cheat, but I think one that's professionally written, like I can't say enough about how important it is uh, that this is good quality writing. I mean, you can uh, have the most compelling story ever, and if it's you know written in, in the, the grammar and the spelling and syntax errors and uh, subject verb agreement issues, right? I mean, these things can steal the thunder from a really good, great, impactful story. Uh, and I think it's just more impactful, at least from my perspective, if it's well written and the subject, you know, can be what it is. Right. But the, the, the quality of the writing matters. Jill? Yeah, I think that for me. And then also when I finish reading it and I can say, oh, this is exactly what the applicant wanted me to pull from it. When it's very, very obvious what the theme or the meat, as Justin said earlier, is of the statement. Um, mm -hmm. That can definitely take something from a good story, a good personal statement to a really great one. Absolutely. Uh, so, Joe, this is another question I think you were pretty fond of. Uh, so what are the top three most engaging ways you've seen a personal statement started or opened? Um, I think, I don't know if I can pick three, um, but I think one of the main ways is to have a really good pulling sentence. Um, if someone's talking about a, an experience, they start by describing the way that they were feeling or what they were seeing um, and those types of things to kind of really draw the reader in and kind of bring them to that moment or to that experience that they're trying to get across. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, for me, I'm, you know, the the opening is is the opportunity to grab attention, right? And I think there are lots of different ways to skin that cat. Uh, I will say I'm not particularly fond of people who open with quotes, right? I mean, I think that's a but that's a that's a uh, my peculiar affectation, right? And that I 
you know, I, I want to hear your voice clearly uh, in the in the opening of a personal statement. Um, you know, but I think there are lots of different ways to do it and lots of different ways to do it well. Uh, so it's not a, a one size fits all sort of thing. Uh, we got a question that's asking about Mar the March 15th deadline. Uh, when we said to apply March 15th, is that March 15th of the year you plan to attend? The answer is yes. Uh, it is March 15th of the year uh, that you plan to uh, begin your law school uh, career. So uh, I think we've covered most of the bases in terms of the questions that we've received uh, related to personal statements. Of course, this will be recorded. So if any of our guests uh, would like to review this for their own records. I think they'll be able to access it on YouTube, maybe. Um, and, you know, Jill, I don't know if you want to leave them with any sort of thoughts in closing as we wrap things up this evening. Um, I think the main thing is, is just make sure that when you finalize your personal statement, it's really speaking to who you are. It's telling us the main things that we need to know about you. Um, and I would recommend taking some time to do some self-reflection, do some free writing. Um, don't leave this till the very last minute. Absolutely. Uh, and I've just, just been confirmed that the video will be sent out via email. So if you registered uh, for tonight's program, you should expect to receive a link to uh, the recorded version of this. Uh, we've got one last question here uh, that says, good to talk about how your thoughts changed over time. Uh, I'll say sure, right? I mean, if you've, you want to talk about your personal growth, I think that can definitely, uh, definitely be something worth uh, exploring in the process. Uh, Jill, any thoughts from you on that? Yeah, I think that's totally fine. If you think that there's something that you need to tell us about how maybe you started off thinking one way and you had an experience that kind of led you to something else that's really changed and impacted who you are. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, I think that that feels like a good place to stop for the evening. Uh, again, we've covered a lot of bases tonight. Uh, I'd encourage anybody who wants to stay in contact with us to do so. Uh, we're pretty easy to find uh, on the website. We always love to have students come in, take a tour of the building, visit with us, get any other questions answered, uh, shoot us an email, give us a call, whatever you like to do. We're pretty responsive here at Wayne Law. So uh, again, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Jill, for joining me this evening, uh, our wonderful moderator, uh, Kaylee, for sacrificing part of her evening to help us get this going. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to communicate with you all in the future. Uh, next week, we'll do something similar about the law school application process generally. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, please visit the website uh, and sign up to join us for that. Uh, beyond that, have a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.